Grace and peace to you from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. Amen. Good morning. It's lovely to see you. Really nice. And to all those on Zoom also, welcome for our Christmas Eucharist. We're going to listen to our first carol, O Come All Ye Faithful.
And we pray together, Almighty God, to whom all hearts are open, all desires known, and from whom no secrets are hidden, cleanse the thoughts of our hearts by the inspiration of your Holy Spirit, that we may perfectly love you and worthily magnify your holy name through Christ our Lord. Amen. Now we're going to light the candles for hope, peace, joy and love. And thank goodness, Carenza and Kathia, you're here. Can you come and do this? We need all of them lit this morning. I think we should let Kabir light the purple ones and Karenza, you light the Christmas one. You have to press that. Press it hard. Oh, good. Strong grip. Okay, well, let Anna do the last one too. She's just come. Anna, would you like to do the last one? Come on then. Thanks, Kabir. You hold, hold on to it at the end here. Okay, and come round here. Well done. Thank you, and Karen is going to like the Christmas one. Good. We light this candle to celebrate Jesus, light of the world, born to be God with us, in him our hope is fulfilled. God's peace is given to us. Our joy is complete. And the fullness of God's love is revealed. Jesus is the light of the world. Whoever follows him will never walk in darkness, but will have the light of life. We're going to have our second carol, Hark the Herald Angels Sing.
Well, this is a most unusual Christmas and a most unusual Christmas service. I, I, know, I don't know, there's not that many children, but there are some children here. Did you do a nativity play at school? No. Because the, the, there was a nativity play, but you, didn't, you weren't part of that. Okay, and did you? No? Well, of course, it's very difficult to do a nativity play when you have to be socially distanced. And here we are, socially distanced. The problem with the Christmas story, as we hear it, as we've told it year after year after year, is that I think we've got a sanitized Christmas story. Sanitize, we're all very used to sanitizing our hands and making them nice and clean. What do I mean by sanitized Christmas story? Well, it wasn't that the conditions where Jesus was born, I mean, you, you know, yes, born in the stable wasn't a sanitary, sort of wasn't a, a, a sterile environment. It wasn't a place where, it wasn't a place where you would get born today in a, in a nice clean, clean place. No, no. But it was sanitized in another sense. I'll tell you why. It kind of, the way we tell it, it, it feels very kind of holy and special and separate because actually Mary and Joseph and the baby that was born were in a little bubble, a kind of social bubble in the stable, tucked away. Is that, the really, is, is that really how it happened? Now, I can't do the usual things with children today, but I, I think you children are very good at using your imagination, so you'll have to imagine with me. Please, grown-ups, I think your imagination should be alive and well too. Now, the problem with the Christmas story we tell it is that we think of it as like a little village in Scotland or Britain somewhere that has a nice little village inn, all right? Bethlehem didn't have a village inn or a pub. No, they never, the small towns like Bethlehem never had an inn. The inns were kept for the Roman soldiers on their main, main highways. There was maybe one between Jerusalem and Caesarea Philippi on the coast in today's Palestine, but certainly not in Bethlehem. And anyway, the word for an inn that's used normally is quite different from the word that we find in the story in the Greek language, which it was written in, not English. And English, is, we've just translated it and put it in inn. It was never an inn, it was a guest room. Imagine a bed and breakfast that's rather crowded. Well, except that actually there's only one guest room in the house. Imagine a house. Now, this is where you really have to imagine because it's quite different from the kind of houses we live in. Because in those days, the poorer families, they would all live in one room. It would be raised on a platform, and if they were a little bit better off, they would have another room that they would keep for the guests. Guests, They may sleep it in themselves, but they would give it to the guests when they arrive. Now, the other thing about Mary and Joseph arriving at Nazareth is that nobody would turn them away. In the Middle East, the hospitality is such, and especially if you said, I am, I'm, I'm an offspring, I'm... I'm um, King David is my ancestor. Oh, they would never turn you away. The family members would welcome you in. No matter how little space they had, they would squeeze you in. But in this particular house, there was absolutely no space. In the guest room, it was already taken when Mary and Joseph arrived. And you know why they were there? Well, of course, the, the, the emperor wanted to count people. Do you know why the emperors and kings and queens in those days wanted to count people? They wanted to make sure they were going to get their taxes paid. Yes. Anyway, Mary and Joseph had travelled from Nazareth down to Bethlehem, and it wasn't the last-minute rush that we normally think of, because Luke says, and I'm telling you the story just as Luke says it, and you can check it up for yourself at home, while they were there, the time came for Mary to have her child. No, it wasn't last-minute rush. Now, what about the stable? Well, yes. Do you know where the stable was? All under the same roof, the houses in those days had a platform where the family lived and cooked and slept, 
And then on the, there was a lower area where the animals were kept. A few sheep, maybe a donkey or two. And on the edge of the platform, there was a manger, the place where the straw was put. So when, ba when Mary had a baby, and I'm sure all the women gathered around, and it was very, very discreet and all that, but the men probably had to go outside. When she had finished having the baby, and all was neat and tidy, she wrapped the baby in the cloth, put the, put the baby Jesus in that manger, right there, and do you know what it was? You see, what I'm trying to say is that the original Christmas story wasn't socially distanced at all. They were all there in the crowd. Now that answers another puzzle which I've often thought about because we hear about the shepherds. Now you know about the shepherds and they heard this lovely choir of angels, hark the herald angels sing, would have probably even better than King's College, Cambridge, which is where that came from. And they were told that there was a baby who was born in Bethlehem who's going to be the saviour of the world. And so they thought, wow, we better go and see. What did they do? Well, Bethlehem wasn't a big village, probably no more than 30, 40 houses or something like that at the, at the most. They knocked on the doors and said, have you got a baby just born? Have you got a baby just born? And they found, they, they came on one place and they said, yes, a baby has just been born. So they went in and they, yes, they marvelled at what they saw and what they'd just heard. And they told everybody in the house what they'd heard. I often wondered how, because it says in Luke's, in the Gospel, it says, and everybody who heard them marveled at what they had told them. Everybody that heard them, did they go out into the street and shout? Did they go knocking on all the doors and say, no, they were just in that house. And there was everybody in the house. And there may have been 30, 25, 30 people in the house. Everybody marveled. You see, that's the Christmas story. Now, why am I telling it like this? I'll tell you. Because if you want to find Jesus, you won't find him in a nice sanitized place, all separate. You will find him in your own home, in the messy places, amongst the crowd, in one another, in those very small, simple acts of kindness that we can do for one another, in our homes, and in our places where we live. And in normal times, we can do it much more easily than we can do it now. But there are people doing it all the time. There are people doing it now, in all sorts of wonderful ways. So that's my way of telling the Christmas story. And I think it's the Luke's way of telling the Christmas story. And I wanted to make sure we heard what Luke had to say. Thank you. So let us pray. Loving God, who gave us Jesus, the child of Bethlehem, to be the one who would show us who you are meant, how we are meant to be. Open our eyes so that we can recognize him in young and old, rich and poor, friends and strangers. Open our ears so that we can hear him in the noisy and busy times, as well as in the quiet, and open our lips so that we can share your message of peace and joy with everyone we meet. We ask this through Jesus the Christ, who now lives and reigns with you and the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. So we'll listen for our epistle reading. This morning's epistle reading is from Hebrews, chapter 1, verse 1 to 4. Shall I read this? At many moments in the past, and by many means, God spoke to our ancestors through the prophets. But in our time, the final days, he has spoken to us through a son, whom he appointed heir of all things, and through whom he made the ages. He is the reflection of God's glory, and bears the impress of God's own being, sustaining all things by his powerful command. And now that he has purged sins away, 
is taken to seat at the right hand of the divine majesty on high. So he is now as far above the angels as the title which he has inherited is higher than his own name. written in the Gospel of John, chapter 1, beginning at the first verse. Glory to Christ our Saviour. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. He was with God in the beginning. Through all things, Him all things came into being. Not one thing came into being except through him. What has come into being in him was life, life that was the light of humankind. And light shines in darkness, and the darkness was not able to comprehend it. The Word was the real light that gives light to everyone. He was coming into the world. He was in the world that had come into being through him, and the world did not recognise him. He came to his own, and his own people did not accept him. But to those who did accept him, he gave power to become the children of God, to those who believed in his name, who were born not from human stock, or human desire, or human will, but from God's own self. The Word became flesh. He lived among us and we saw his glory, the glory that he has from the Father, full of grace and truth. Give thanks to the Lord for this glorious gospel. Praise to Christ our Lord. There were two words that in ancient Greece were used for understanding and accounting for what was happening in the world. They were logos and mythos. Logos, translated into English in the prologue that we've just heard read from John's Gospel, means literally logic and rationality. The problem is that logic and rationality on its own cannot account for the mystery and the paradoxes we find in the world, let alone the mystery of incarnation. <clears throat> so we need mythos, meaning story. And that is where the stories of the birth of Christ come in. And we have two different versions on, one in Matthew and one that I concentrated on today in Luke, that I just retold, as it were. The problem is that in combining them together to tell our version of the Christmas story, we've lost the message that the authors of these two stories were trying to convey to us through them. Now, the Greeks also spoke about the mythological. That is to say, there is a second kind of logic. This kind of logic is not about the mind, but about imagination, about deep feelings and it's about profound connections and it's also about mysteries and ultimately about wisdom. And that is why I believe the unknown author of the prologue to John's Gospel chose Logos, translated as word in English, to speak about the mystery of the Incarnation. For the Greek-speaking world of his day, Logos carried a depth of meaning that the word word in English cannot. For Heraclitus, a famous Greek philosopher who lived around 500 years before Christ, Logos was the universal, the universal principle through which all things are interrelated and all natural events occur. It's the divine wisdom by which all things are guided. It is the divine word received by the prophets. And he complained that most people, failing to understand the underlying interrelatedness of all that is manifest in our universe, 
lived like dreamers with a false view of the world. Failing to see the underlying connection between opposites such as health and disease, good and evil, hot and cold and other opposites, and so they were unable to make sense of the chaotic and divergent nature of the world, much as most people can't make sense of it today. But the light shines in the darkness, and the darkness was not able to comprehend it, which is the right way of translating that. Philo of Alexander, a Jewish philosopher, contemporary with Jesus, also spoke of the Logos as the agent of creation and related that to wisdom. And the Jewish wisdom tradition understood wisdom as the feminine companion to Yahweh, often translated, usually translated in the Old Testament as Lord, rejoicing with him and enjoying his creation. Indeed, the feminine counterpart was El Shaddai, the God with breasts, feminine. And in Genesis, it is the word that God speaks that acts to bring into form and being, the, to fill the space with life, culminating in the archetypal human being created in the image of the one who is many, as the name Elohim for God implies. The word that was the real light that gives light to everyone, he was coming into the world, says the prologue. Yes, that light has been shining ever since the beginning. The word was taking shape in many different ways. As it said in the epistle, of many moments in the past and by many means, God spoke to our ancestors through the prophets. But in our time, the final days, he has spoken to us through a son whom he has appointed heir of all things and through whom he made the ages, meaning the universe of time and space. As Richard Rohr is fond of saying, the incarnation did not just happen when Jesus was born, although that is when we became aware of the human incarnation of God in Jesus. What happened in Jesus is that the original archetype, the blueprint for who we are all created to be, each in our unique way, took shape in the flesh and blood of an actual person, whose life and teaching embodied the wisdom that has always been there since the beginning, but that all but a few human beings have lost touch with. And he calls us to become what he is by the same energy of life that filled him and that gave him birth, the breath and life of God that we call the Holy Spirit. The incarnation is also happening today in you and me, if you say yes to God in the same way that Mary said yes to the angel in Luke's Christmas story. Amen. Let us affirm our faith together. We are not alone. We live in God's world. We believe in God, who has created and is creating, who has come in Jesus, the Word in the flesh, to reconcile and make new, who works in us and others by the Spirit. We trust in God. We are called to be the church, to celebrate God's presence, to love and serve others, to seek justice and to resist evil, to proclaim Jesus crucified and risen, our judge and our hope, 
in life, in death, in life beyond death. God is with us. We are not alone. Thanks be to God. And now let us pray for the world, for all God's people and for his church. I shall use a bidding this morning, Lord hear us, to which your reply is, Holy Child, hear us. Lord, hear us. Holy Child, hear us. Holy Child of Bethlehem, whose parents found no room in the inn, we pray for all who will be homeless tonight. Lord, hear us. Holy Child, hear us. Holy Child of Bethlehem, born in a stable, we pray for all who are living in poverty, those who have lost their jobs, those who have no hope. Lord, hear us. Holy Child, hear us. Holy Child of Bethlehem, rejected stranger, we pray for all who are lost, alone, those who cry for loved ones they will not see this Christmas because of COVID. And we pray for the sick, and especially for Jean Russell. Lord, hear us. Holy, Holy Child, hear us. Holy Child of Bethlehem, whom Herod sought to kill, we pray for all who live in danger, in Gaza, and in Bethlehem today, victims of violence in Syria, Yemen, and the Holy Land. Lord, hear us. Holy Child, hear us. Holy Child of Bethlehem, a refugee in Egypt, we pray for all who are far from their homes, the refugees and asylum seekers who call for our support. Lord, hear us. Holy Child, hear us. Holy Child of Bethlehem, we thank and praise you that you, in you, the Eternal, was pleased to dwell. Help us, we pray, to see the divine image in people everywhere, and may they find you in us. Amen. God is love, and we are God's children. There is no room for fear in love. We love because God loved us first. So let us confess our sins in penitence and faith. For thoughts that are selfish, Lord, forgive us. For words that have no Lord, forgive us for actions that are not loving. Lord, forgive us for failing to love and care. 
Lord, forgive us and deliver us from the power of evil. For the sake of your Son who died for us, Jesus Christ our Lord. Christ says to all who turn away from sin, go in peace, you are forgiven. We meet in Christ's name, so let us share his peace. And even though we can't share it as we normally would, we're still sharing it together and with those on Zoom. So let us present our offerings to the Lord. Yours, Lord, is the greatness, the power, the glory, the splendor, and the majesty. For everything in heaven and on earth is yours. All things come from you, and of your own do we give you. The Lord be with you. Lift up your hearts. Let us give thanks to the Lord our God. Worship and praise belong to you, God our Maker. Out of nothing you called all worlds into being, and still you draw the universe to its fulfillment. Day and night celebrate your glory and time will be no more. In Christ, your word became flesh and was born of the Virgin Mary. He emptied himself, taking our human form, that through his incarnation and passion, 
we might come to share in the divine nature. Filled with the Spirit, who at the first creation moved over the face of the waters and overshadowed the Blessed Virgin of Nazareth, we await with joy the fulfillment of your creation. As children of your redeeming purpose, who celebrate the birth of your Son, we offer you our praise with angels and archangels and the whole company of heaven singing the hymn of your unending glory. Holy, holy, holy Lord, God of power and might, heaven and earth are full of your glory. Hosanna in the highest. Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Hosanna in the highest. Glory and thanksgiving be to you, most loving Father, for the gift of your Son born in human flesh. He is the Word existing beyond time, both source and final purpose, bringing to wholeness all that is made. Obedient to your will, he died upon the cross. By your power, you raised him from the dead. He broke the bonds of evil and set your people free to be his body in the world. On the night when he was given up to death, knowing that his hour had come, having loved his own, he loved them to the end. At supper with his disciples, Jesus took bread and offered you thanks. He broke the bread and gave it to them, saying, Take, eat, this is my body, it is broken for you. After supper, he took the cup, he offered you thanks and gave it to them, saying, Drink this, all of you. This is my blood of the new covenant. It is poured out for you and for all, that sins may be forgiven. Do this in remembrance of me. We now obey your son's command. We recall his blessed passion and death, his glorious resurrection and ascension, and we look for the coming of his kingdom. Made one with him, we offer you these gifts, and with them ourselves, a single, holy, living sacrifice. Hear us, most merciful Father, and send your Holy Spirit upon us, and upon this bread and this wine, that overshadowed by his life-giving power, They may be the body and blood of your Son, and we may be kindled with the fire of your love and renewed for the service of his kingdom. Help us, who are baptized into the fellowship of Christ's body, to live and work to your praise and glory. May we grow together in unity and love, Until at last in your new creation, we enter into our heritage in the company of the Virgin Mary, the apostles and prophets, Martin, and of all our brothers and sisters, living and departed. Through Jesus Christ, our Lord, to whom with you and the Holy Spirit be all honor and glory, now and forever. Amen. The living bread is broken for the life of the world. As our Saviour has taught us, so we pray. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as in heaven. Give us today our daily bread. 
Forgive us our sins as we forgive those who sin against us. Do not bring us to the time of trial, but deliver us from evil. For the kingdom, the power, and the glory are yours, now and forever. Amen. Behold the Lamb of God, behold him who takes away the sin of the world. Happy are those who are called to his feast. The gifts of God for the people of God. And the blood of Christ, the cup of salvation shed for us all. Give thanks to our gracious God. Source of truth and joy, may we who have received the gift of the divine life always follow the way of your Son. This we ask in the name of Jesus Christ the Lord. Amen. Father, we have broken the bread, which is Christ's body. We have tasted the wine of his new life. We thank you for these gifts by which we are made one in him and drawn into that new creation, which is your will for all. Through him who died for us and rose again, your son, our saviour, Jesus Christ. Amen. going to listen to one of my favorite carols, Joy to the World. The blessing of the manger, God's creation all around, the blessing of the shepherds, God's people with feet on the ground, the blessing of the angels, good news for all, and peace for the world, be with you now and forever, and the blessing of God Almighty, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, be amongst you and be with you always. Amen.
go in peace to love and serve the Lord and have a very happy, if different, Christmas. But when there's been all this talk about Christmas is going to be cancelled, the fact of the matter is that Christ has come to make all things new. Thank you. Thank you, Chris, for playing for us. Uh, and um, just to, to say quickly that um, next, this, this coming Sunday, there isn't a service, but we will be meeting back here on January the 3rd. So that's the next time we will be in this uh, church, in this sanctuary here. The government guidelines permit us to meet in numbers up to 20 only. Um, Judging by the kind of numbers we've been getting, um, that should still mean that most of you who want to come here can come. We will still be doing the hybrid version with Zoom, people joining on Zoom as well as live here in the sanctuary. So have a very happy day. God bless.